In Matthew chapter 26, the scripture says that he asked three disciples in particular. He took all of his disciples to the garden. But Peter, James, and John were the inner circle as it is. Peter probably was one of the leaders, the natural leaders in this particular group. He took them a little farther than the others. And then he asked them, he said, now watch here and pray with me. I want you to pray with me. I'm, I'm, he was trying to explain to them, I'm going into an hour of incredible trial, and I, I need you here at this time. Now, Luke 22, verse 45, tells us about the same scenario. He said he, he found them sleeping for sorrow. There was a sorrow that had come upon them. and Perhaps they were confused. They were overwhelmed at the events unfolding around them. And, of course, you can't misunderstand or the depth of the spiritual conflict that would have been happening. There's a spiritual conflict that they're not even, they can feel it, no doubt, but they're not aware of what it is. They have had in their minds a sense of how God should be operating. And the way Christ is moving seems to be going in an opposite way to the, the way they think it should be. Peter himself has stood at one point before Christ and he said, No, not you. You're not, you're not going to Jerusalem. You're not going to be crucified. No, this is not the way that you're, you're going to go. Now, all of a sudden, they see events already are spiraling all out of control all around them. And naturally, and you and I in the same circumstances, we, we have the advantage of knowledge today that they didn't have. Oh, the word was there, but they weren't hearing it. And they were confused. They're overwhelmed. I think they're very saddened. It's certainly possible that they are disappointed and discouraged at their own inabilities to live up to the incredible boasts that they had recently made. They had been boasting before God. If you follow with me right back to just before our opening text, in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 31, Then said Jesus to them, All ye shall be offended because of me this night, for it is written, I will smite the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock shall be scattered abroad. But after that I'm risen again, I'll go before you into Galilee. Now, he's telling them. Now, keep in mind, this is, this is God speaking. And, and he's not only speaking, but he's quoting scripture as well. And so now they're, they're confronted, in a sense, by what God is speaking. He says to them, now listen to me. Tonight, you're all going to fail. Tonight, you're all going to run. You're, you're going to be put in a position that you're not able to stand. And you're all going to be offended. In other words, you're, the, the, word, the context of the word offended is different than the way we read it today. It means scattered, afraid. You're not going to be able to stand. I'm, I'm going to be smitten tonight, and you're going to be scattered. But I'm going to rise again, and I'm going to go before you into Galilee. And so here's the word of God. Now, Peter immediately, verse 33, answered and said, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, Yet will I never be offended. Now, it's an incredible thing. Now, this is religious zeal. But it's religious zeal that is standing directly in, in the face, as it is, of the revealed Word of God. Jesus is saying one thing, and Peter is responding in the opposite spirit. He's actually defying the Word of God. And he's doing it with religious zeal. Folks, religious zeal does not make something right. We're living in an age of, of, of tremendous zeal. I, and there, there are people out there trying to serve God with all their might, not realizing they're standing directly in the face of revealed Scripture. And zeal doesn't make it right. Peter answers, and he's indignant, and he stands, and he musters his strength, and he says, No! All men may run from you. I don't care what the Word of God says. I don't care what you say. I don't care what's written in the Bible. All men may fail, but I will not fail. Then Jesus said to him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Now, again, here's the, folks, you've got to understand, this is the God who created the universe is speaking to him. This is Christ who's not, not arguing, even the humility of God to even enter into this dialogue. It's amazing when you consider it. Everything he speaks is absolute truth. It's, it's not even negotiable. If he says, let there be light, there's light. If he says, turn the light out, the light is out. And here he is arguing with this man. And Peter said, Though I should die with thee, yet I will not deny thee. And likewise said also all the disciples. Now this is an amazing thing. They have a choice. The other eleven can either agree with God or agree with Peter. 
And Peter is such a, a natural, strong leader. Plus, also, this, this is what is in the heart of all men. We, we don't want to see ourselves as weak. We, we don't want to see ourselves as incapable of performing something. We, we all want to see ourselves as strong and able. And so they all agree with Peter. So here, the whole thing, they're all li- literally believing a lie about themselves. Right at the, the very pivotal point of their own redemption. So now we leave from here and we go into the Garden of Gethsemane. And Jesus says, all right, you all sit over here. Now, Peter, you, because Peter, of course, is the one who led the whole pile of them into this era of thinking about themselves and James and John. Now, John's the one who leaned his head on Jesus' breast at the Last Supper. Peter's a man with natural strength. I will not deny you. And and John may have been resting on the fact that, well, I love him. You know, you know, I love him. He knows I love him. I'm the disciple Jesus loves, and certainly I can't fail. And I don't know where James fits in all of this, but Jesus calls them all in. And he says, come a little farther now. He says, I, I, I'm, I'm trusting you now all to pray with me. And, uh, and then in chapter 26 and verse 40, he comes out after praying, and he comes to his disciples and finds them asleep and says to Peter, what? Could you not watch with me one hour? Now, folks... This is a a passage of scripture that has the enemy has used to condemn so many people for years, for generations since the day it was written down, because they fail to understand the context of this. We look at it and they can't pray for an hour. They pray for 48 minutes and walk out all condemned, hearing this voice. What? Could you not pray with me for one hour? Oh, folks, I've lived through this. I'd pray for an hour and 15 minutes, and I'd, I'd get up off my knees. What? Could you not pray with me for an hour and a half? I'd pray for an hour and a half. What? Could you not pray with me for an hour and 45 minutes? There's just no end to this. And the enemy takes this and just literally grinds the people of God with this scripture. But it's not as harsh as it sounds. It sounds harsh, but folks, it really isn't that harsh. You see, this is the issue. Peter made this incredible boast. And the rest followed him and made this incredible boast of their natural strength and how they were going to walk with God and how they would not deny him. But this is without possessing the inward life of God that was about to be given to them through the death of Christ and the resurrection. The power of the Holy Ghost had not yet come. And Jesus comes out from praying with his father and looks at Peter And it's in the context of his boast. And he says, what, could you not watch with me one hour? I thought you were going to go all the way as it is to Calvary. I thought you were going to die. You can't, you were going to go with me and you're going to die with me, but you can't even watch for one hour. That's the context of what Jesus is speaking to him. He's not condemning him. He's trying to bring him to an understanding of his own frailty, his own inability, his own need of a resource within himself much greater than anything in his natural ability that he can muster. That's why so many people fail and fall and become discouraged. Because they read the scriptures and then sit out in their own power to make it a reality. But we are incapable of making it a reality. I can't love anybody the way God wants me to love them. I can't forgive a single soul the way Christ wants me to forgive. The burden is too heavy. I can't do it. That's why Jesus said, come to me, all ye who labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Come learn of me. I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your soul. Oh, thank God for this incredible life of Christ that he's willing to give to all who place their trust in him. As Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Ghost, so we too are raised out of the weakness of death and brought into the power of an endless life. So we too are given strength beyond our natural strength, an ability far beyond any natural ability that you and I will ever possess. And we come to the place where our testimony is like the Apostle Paul. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. I can be a loving man. I can forgive my enemies. I can go beyond the limits of this natural body and this natural mind. I can be brought to places where I could never have gone in my own strength. You see, this is where the Scripture begins to make sense. When the Bible tells us it's a faithful saying, if we die with him, we'll also live with him. If we give up as it is our own will, if we yield 
our own strength, or so we think it is, and begin to realize it for the weakness it is. Trust in Christ for our salvation. Allow the power of the Holy Spirit to come upon us. And God's life becomes our life. And all of a sudden, things that were so heavy are now within the realm of possibility to accomplish because his life is within us. In verse 43, it says, He came and found them asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And I want to tell you something. When your eyes are focused on yourself, they're always going to be heavy. You're always going to be discouraged. You're going to go home at night and look in the mirror, and you're going to feel like a failure. You go to your knees, you can't even pray. You get up in the morning, you have no joy. Because your eyes are all f- you're focused in the wrong place. You're looking at your own strength, and you're looking for some resource in yourself to even live as a Christian, and it isn't there, beloved. It is not there apart from Christ. We cannot do it. Now, in verse 45, it says, He came to His disciples and said to them, Sleep on now and take your rest. I used to, I used to look at that as, as if they were completely defeated. This was an indictment as it is against them. Sleep on now. You came, I needed your help, you couldn't give it to me, now go ahead and just sleep. But you know folks, that's really not the context of this verse. I believe what Christ is saying, all right now, fellows, put your human effort to rest. You've tried and you've realized you can't do this. So put it to rest. Put it aside. You see, because help is on the way. Folks, help is on the way. You, there's so many people here today, you, you're trying so hard. And you're, you're walking with your, your, you got your teeth gritted and you're doing it as hard as you can and you're getting so fed up and your eyes are so heavy. Jesus says to you tonight, sleep on. You're never going to accomplish it in your own strength. Put this human effort away. See, the walk with Christ is a walk of faith. It's not that we don't do something, but we don't do it in our natural strength. We take the promises of God that He has given to us, we believe them, and trust that the life of Christ in us through the Holy Spirit will make these promises a reality. That that God will lift us, and God will take us where He is asking us to go. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17, Paul says it this way, Now, the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Now, the word liberty in the Greek means generosity. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is generosity. Now, remember, Jesus said when the Comforter comes, He's going to take what is mine, what I'm going to purchase for you as it is on Calvary, and He's going to show it to you. Everything that is mine is going to be yours. Paul says where the Spirit of the Lord is. If... The Spirit of God is within you. If you are truly a child of God, if you've been born again by the Spirit of God, you have within you now an incredible generosity of God. This incredible supply of life is now within you. Do you understand this? If, if, if you don't understand this, for, forget trying to live the Christian life. You have this incredible supply in Christ that is given to you by the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit within you. But we all, he says, with open face beholding as in a glass the glory, or that means the weightiness, the the abundance as it is of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Paul's saying as we behold this incredible victory of Christ, in the fullness of its weight, and the fullness of its resources, we ask and we trust and we're changed into the very victory of new life, that which is in Christ, which we are looking at. Is as we see Him, as we comprehend His victory, as we see the, the weightiness of God's incredible mercy, as we see the incredible scope, Paul says, of His victory, we just simply look at it. We behold it in the Word of God. And we believe it in our hearts. We are changed into the same image of that inexhaustible strength and victory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. The Christian life is to be a supernatural life. It's to be a life that is lived by God inside of those who have made the choice to believe Him. Verse 4, he says, Therefore seeing... Chapter 4, rather, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have received this ministry and have received mercy, we faint not. Here's the source of the Christian life. 
and the source of our strength, the ministry and the mercy is Christ in us, the hope of glory. Verse 2, he says, but we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully. Here's what I believe Paul is saying. We renounce this inner corruptible image of ourselves without Christ that we have. We do not craftily and deceitfully deal with God, telling Him we can, even though God's Word says we can't and we won't. That's deceitful dealing with God. When you and I, who bear the image of Christ, walk away saying, no, I can do this. No, you can't do this. Only Christ in you can win the victory. Only Christ in you can walk through that victory. We do not craftily and deceitfully deal with the Word of God. That's exactly what Peter and the disciples were doing in Matthew 26. Jesus was telling them one thing and they were throwing in the name of religious zeal and determination and dedication as they saw it in themselves. They're throwing a contrary statement back in his face. He was saying, you can't do this. And they were saying, we can Paul says, no, we have received this ministry. It is a ministry of mercy. It keeps those who trust in him. We renounce these hidden things of dishonesty. We do not walk in craftiness. We do not handle the word of God deceitfully. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. This is what Paul is saying. But with truth in the power of the Holy Spirit now manifested in us, This truth that carries us, this truth that enables us, we stand as a warning to every man's conscience in this generation that he too, who is without God, is incapable of finishing the race. We stand as a warning. Folks, you are to stand as a warning to this generation. The glory of God is to be in you. You and I are to be so changed by this inward working of Christ. And our testimony is not how we did it. Our testimony is simply that we believe God who did it for us and does it in us and through us. Therefore, we stand as a testimony to our generation. This testimony is simply that no man can change without the Spirit of God. No man can obey God unless God gives him the power to be obedient. Some people are offended at the simplicity of Christ. Jesus said it this way in verse 20, Verily I say to you, you shall weep and lament. Now this is, of course, just prior to what we read in Matthew 26. But the world shall rejoice, and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. In other words, The whole world in that time, of course, is going to rejoice that the Son of God is is crucified. And you're going to be sorrowful, but your sorrow is going to turn into joy. A woman, when she's in travail, is sorrow because her hour has come. But as soon as she's delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. Now, he's he's telling his disciples, there's going to be a, a time of great travail for you. But you're going to come through this travail with incredible joy and new life. And you now, therefore, have sorrow. But I will see you again, and your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man will take from you. I'm going to give you a joy that no one can take from you, because, you see, it's not given by anything of this world. It's not given by any man. It doesn't come from natural strength. It's a supernatural strength and a supernatural life and a supernatural joy. I'm going to give it to you. You're going to get up in the morning and say, God Almighty, I'm changing. I'm changing. Lord, I'm loving that person that I work with at work. And I I don't know how it happened, but I just asked you to do it. And I'm putting one foot in front of the other. I'm believing you, God. And my heart is changing. And there's a joy. Folks, the joy comes from understanding that I'm living in a supernatural life with Christ. His life is in me. It's Christ in us. It's not a concept about Christ. It's not you and I trying to prove something to Christ. It's coming to one who has finished the work. He's finished our redemption. He's overthrown our enemies. He's provided strength for our weakness and covering for our failure and joy for our sorrow. Everything you will ever want is in Jesus Christ. It's all in Him. 
He says, I'm going to give you a joy, verse 22, and no man will take it from you. Verse 23, and in that day you shall ask me nothing. And actually, the original text says it this way. You're not going to be confused anymore, if I can paraphrase it. You're not going to have any more questions. You'll not be sort of like Gethsemane theology. You'll not be sitting there frustrated and trying to do all of these things in your own strength. You will no longer be in this frame of mind. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it to you. Now, folks, you either believe that or you don't. You either believe it or you don't. There's no middle ground on this. Jesus said it. It's in red letter. Whatever you ask. Now, we know in the New Testament, we don't ask for things to consume them on our own lust. You will not get them. But to be asking God for the power to love and the power to forgive and the power to stand and the power to preach and the power to teach and the power to publish and the power to defend the gospel of Jesus Christ is not asking to consume it on our own lusts. He says, ask the Father in my name and he will give it to you. Verse 24, he says, hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. And that's exactly what happened. They were all there saying, we can, we will. We will not deny you. We will walk with you. I can, I will, we can, we will. He said, hitherto you've asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy might be full. Ask, you shall receive that your joy might be full. How do I get the victory? Ask, you shall receive that your joy might be full. How do I become a man or woman of prayer? Ask, you shall receive that your joy might be full. How do I forgive people who have wronged me and abused me? Ask, you shall receive and your joy shall be full. How do I preach the gospel in this generation? Where do I find the power? Ask, you shall receive and your joy shall be full. Hallelujah. Thank God. Thank God that it's not humanly possible to live the Christian life. Thank God that the ground is level at the cross. Thank God that rich and poor and educated and uneducated and weak and strong can all come to the cross in the same life and the same power is available. Thank God, thank God, thank God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank God. All you have to do is ask and believe and begin to walk in what God says. And the Holy Spirit will make the promises of Christ a living reality within your life. And as Paul says, your life will become a commendation as it is of God to every man's conscience in this generation. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God help us. God help us. God help us. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, saith the Lord, which is and which was and which is to come, the Almighty. He which testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come. Lord Jesus.